The world seems almost infinitely complicated, made up of thousands, if not millions, of different materials. Throughout history, people have tried to collect, categorise and analyse them to find some underlying pattern that would help simplify this seemingly incredibly complicated world. Now, at the dawn of the 21st century, we've made some progress to achieving that long, yearned-for simplification. With the use of particle accelerators, we are starting to understand the nature of the world around us. These machines have revealed a whole array of particles which, we believe, may be the fundamental building blocks of matter. But back in the 19th century, scientists thought that everything on Earth was made of just over 80 elements. These elements were famously arranged in a periodic table by Dmitry Mendeleev. At the time, it was thought that elements were made of indivisible spheres called atoms. But each of the elements behaved in a different way. Did that mean that there were 80 different kinds of atom? And if so, what made them different? Were they different shapes or sizes? Or maybe the atoms were divisible. Maybe they were built of even smaller objects. It was here in Cambridge that the first clear evidence for smaller objects inside the atom was found. Many of the great scientists of history have walked these streets, and one of the greatest was J.J. Thompson, who became the director of this, the old Cavendish Laboratory. In 1896, Thompson had just got his hands on this new piece of kit. Now, it's essentially a particle accelerator. When this plate's heated, particles are emitted. They're accelerated by these electrodes, they pass through these two plates, across which you can apply a voltage, and they hit the end of the bulb here on a screen which glows, so you can see the beam. Now this is a modern version of Thomson's apparatus. Again, we've got the particle accelerator, and there's a screen in there, so you can see the beam glow. What Thomson did was he varied the voltage across the plates, and he measured the amount of bending as the voltage changed. That allows you to deduce the mass of the particles in the beams. Now, the lightest known particle in Thomson's day was the hydrogen atom. But Thomson found from these measurements that the particles in this beam are almost 2,000 times lighter than hydrogen atoms. Thomson had discovered the first subatomic particle, the electron. The uh, electron owes its practical utility, utility to its smallness. It might apparently Shakespeare say my use is great because I am so small. The electron was the first discovery of a fundamental particle and it is interesting to realise that more than a hundred years later the electron is still, to the best measurements we can do today, a fundamental letter of nature's alphabet. We can use electrons as ways to probe materials and look at the structure in electron microscopes or in big machines like this accelerator behind me. Pretty much all of, of everything we do in the, in the 21st century depends on understanding the properties of electrons. Thomson had discovered that the atom is not the fundamental building block of matter. There are smaller objects inside. So atoms could no longer be thought of as hard, indivisible spheres. But how did the electrons fit inside the atom? Thomson suggested that the atom was something like this muffin, with the negatively charged electrons embedded in a positive body. It would be a student of Thomson's that proved him wrong. The mystery of how the electrons fitted inside the atom was eventually solved here in Manchester, in this building in 1911, by Ernest Rutherford. Rutherford was, in my opinion, one of the first proper particle physicists because he used beams of particles as projectiles to explore the structure of matter. Now, of course, in Rutherford's day, there was no such thing as a particle accelerator. So he used the decay of radioactive elements to produce his beams of particles. This is Rutherford's original desk. And in fact, if you hunt around a little bit, 
you can detect traces of radioactivity a hundred years later. Rutherford asked two of his students, Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, to fire some alpha particles at a piece of thin gold foil and see what happened. So imagine these tennis balls are the alpha particles. Now if the atom were as Thomson had suggested, a kind of amorphous blob, then you'd expect the alpha particles to pass right through. And that's indeed what happened to most of them. But to their surprise, they found that around one in 8,000 bounced right back. After two years of puzzling over the meaning of these results, Rutherford realised that in order for the alpha particles to bounce back, they must hit something small and dense. So his new model of the atom was a bit like the solar system, with all the mass concentrated at the centre and the electrons orbiting like planets around the sun. Today we know that this picture isn't quite correct. Quantum mechanics tells us that we can't know precisely where the electrons are but we can predict that they reside in distinct shells around the nucleus. Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment was remarkably direct and simple and it showed the nature of what the atomic structure is. By the way the alpha particles bounced off the atom, he worked out where the positive charge of the atom lives. Rutherford had come to the astonishing conclusion that most of the atom, and therefore most of what we think of as ordinary matter, is in fact empty space. So if this apple were the atomic nucleus, the electrons would be a kilometre away. After discovering the nucleus, Rutherford continued doing experiments, firing particles at different targets to delve into the structure of the nucleus itself. By 1932, Rutherford and his colleague James Chadwick had found that the nucleus is made of two kinds of particles, positively charged protons and electrically neutral neutrons. The discovery in these experiments of neutrons and charged atoms of mass 1 has proved of great significance and importance and has given us a much clearer understanding of the actual structure of nuclei. Less than a century after Mendeleev published his periodic table, scientists had arrived at a seemingly beautiful simplification. All this is made of just three fundamental particles, the proton, the neutron and the electron. Now, this was a giant step forward in our understanding of matter, but there were still phenomena that couldn't be explained in terms of just these three particles. <laughs> 